Okay, so Real Capital Analytics is a business that focuses on the real estate investment market. So we're a data and analytics provider. Uh, we provide deal, deal level information all around the world. So everywhere a deal happens in Europe, over 5 million euros, we track it. It goes into our system and I pull the data out and produce charts like the ones I'm going to show to you, talking about the investment market. So I'm not going to really mention the, the occupier side of things um, much during the presentation or focus on capital market trends. So just to kick off, what are we seeing in, in Europe at the moment? So this is a chart that's showing European property investment volumes quarter by quarter. Um, and you can see we've seen a little bit of a slowing in the first half of this year. Um, Q1 was especially slow across Europe. Q2 we have seen a pickup. Um, and Q3 looks okay at the moment relatively slow. I think we're certainly going to see this year finish slower than last year in terms of total investment volumes and that's on the back of political concerns, you know, the economic uncertainty that's doing the rounds, um, very high pricing in the core markets that I think is deterring some of the investors from, from doing deals at the moment. But focusing particularly on France because actually the French market is actually bucking this trend of a slowing in comparison to this time last year. So the first half of this year was the slowest for five years across the whole of Europe, but that's not the case in France. So of the top five European markets, the French markets, the only ones have seen any growth in investment volumes. The other point I'd make about this chart as well is if you can compare France with the other top, you know, the other top two mar the top three markets, UK and Germany, the commercial slice of the markets, that's office retail and industrial is very much on a par with Germany and the UK and really it's the lack, the relative lack of a sort of an alternatives type market in France that's holding back total investment. So although we're starting to see some investment in the residential sector, it's very much at a lower level than we see in the UK and Germany. Similarly for, for student housing, hotels has kind of had a slow start to year in France, that's kind of not reflected there. So strong year strong start to the year in the French investment market. And the other thing to say is also we saw a record number of deals last year as well. So if you kind of I haven't got the, the deal count for the start of the, for this year because it kind of distorts the chart a little bit. But you can see that last year we recorded more deals than ever before in France. Investment volume slightly down, but not by very much. And we've actually had you know four really quite strong years of total investment, investment approaching sort of 40 billion euros. So four very strong years, record deal count last year. French is the only top, France is the only top five market to have seen growth uh, in the first half of this year. Um, and one of the things we think is a positive for the French market at the moment is the fact that economic sentiment seems to be holding up slightly better than across the Eurozone in you know, comparison with Germany. So this is a chart that shows economic sentiment it's produced by the European Commission, you know, you can get, up, get it for yourselves off Eurostat. And you can see clearly, Germany, investment sentiment has kind of been going down and down and down. Same in the Euro, in the Euro, in sort of the EU 28 as a whole. France has kind of picked up a little bit this year, had been on a downwards path, it's kind of picked up. And I think that really reflects the fact that the French economy is really driven by, well, it's largely driven by domestic demand. The slowdown in Germany is linked very much to global trade, you know, the kind of trade dispute between the US and China and the effect that's having on the German manufacturing sector in particular. France, much more domestically driven, and for that reason seems to be doing slightly better in comparison with the European average. So that's been a positive for the market, certainly. It also looks relatively good on a political basis, you know, I, I guess you can talk about the Gilets Jaunes demonstrations and all that kind of stuff, but I don't think it's had necessarily a a very marked knock-on effect on what's happening in the investment market, whereas the reverse is certainly true in the UK if you look at the impact of Brexit. You know, the UK is very slow this year in terms of uh, total investment volumes down by more than 30%. And a lot of that is on the back of a slowing to do with Brexit and the uncertainty that's created and the fact that you know, investors aren't necessarily willing to commit to the market at the moment. So decent economic sentiment and also pick up an overseas investment into France as well. So last year we saw as a percentage of the market, you know, overseas investment, you know, almost as high as it's been, not quite as high as back in 2008, sorry, seven for example, but that's certainly been picking up, there's definitely been a marked increase in 
in overseas capital coming into France. I mean, for, for a few years, you know, the French domestic investors were very competitive. There's a lot of money coming into the retail funds. Uh, but last year, we saw quite a lot of capital coming in from the rest of Europe, so from Germany and the UK and Switzerland primarily. And this year, we've seen a real marked increase in the amount of South Korean money that's being spent in Paris particularly. So you can see that on this chart. So this chart shows South Korean investment outside Asia. So this is investment by South Korean headquartered investors. Last year, well, really for the kind of all for the, the lifetime of this chart, their investment levels into France have been relatively small. You know, what, maybe 100 million, 200 million per, per annum, something like that. This year, we've seen almost 4 billion euros worth of acquisitions by South Korean headquartered investors. They clearly switched emphasis from London towards Paris this year. Um, you know, there were, uh, some of the South Korean institutions were big investors in central London last year, uh, but that's now changed. So France has become much more attractive, I guess from a political point of view, from diversification point of view. Paris is appreciated because you get the large lot sizes. You know, if you look at the average lot size involving a South Korean buyer in Europe, it's around 200 million euros. So they're buying very large assets. And clearly, an office market as big as Paris, there's a lot of these assets out there to buy. There's also a hedging premium that they can exploit. Um, and there's, you know, the, the political risk angle as well. You know, and that's certainly deterred some of the investment coming into London in comparison with last year, for example. So France has really benefited from this flow of South Korean money. I think I was talking to someone about this the other day, and there was a sense that perhaps that's going to be kind of, you know, there's not an inexhaustible supply of deal, you know, supply of properties, and also an inexhaustible appetite for properties in Paris. And what we're also seeing is South Korean investors expanding to elsewhere in Europe. So, you know, buying in Poland, in the Czech Republic, um, in Ireland, in Luxembourg. So they're not solely focused on very core prime markets like London and Paris. They're showing a willingness to invest elsewhere, and that might limit some of the investment activity in the future. Just to say who these buyers are, because I thought it was interesting to give you a kind of a rundown of who, these, who, who actually these institutions are. So I've got their acquisitions for 2019 on the left-hand side. So you can see all the names down there. I think the point I, would, I was going to make on this chart was really look at the how much they've acquired in France before 2019. So most of these institutional investors are new to the French market, only what, four out of the, the ones I've got listed there, five out of the ones listed there have acquired anything in France previously. So these are new players to the market, it's a new source of capital, and that's clearly a good thing when it comes to liquidity. Um, because para, you know, RCA produces, a, I should explain this chart before I talk about it, RCA produces a liquidity score for 155 markets around the world. It's based on our in-house proprietary data sets, and it tries to score each of these markets out of 100 on the basis of its <coughs> liquidity. Um, and the fact that Paris is so attractive to overseas capital means that liquidity levels are significantly elevated. If you compare you know, where central Paris is at the moment to Lyon, which is the second biggest French market, you know, liquidity levels are almost double according to our scores. In Paris, and one, one of the reasons for that is because of its attractiveness to overseas money. Um, so that's a factor in our in our scores. So when we're putting together these scores, we look at what proportion of the overseas money that's spent around the world does Paris, you know, central Paris, or the Western business districts account for. So liquidity is much higher in these markets, and that's why they're part of the reason. It kind of helps. You know, it's kind of a virtuous circle. They're more liquid, so they attract overseas capital, and that helps maintain levels of liquidity. And you can see that actually on the chart in the last downturn, actually liquidity levels did not fall away in Paris, in any of the Paris submarkets there, in the same way that they did, for example, in somewhere like London, where we saw a sharper fall in, in liquidity, or maybe Frankfurt, or San Francisco, or somewhere like that. So actually on, on, on this measure, it also makes Paris look relatively attractive from a sort of volatility point of view. There's clearly a link between property level liquidity um, pricing. So what would you expect? You'd expect the pricing in the more liquid markets to be, to, you know, the more liquid markets to be more expensive. And so you can see this is a price index we produce for commercial properties. We, you know, we have a 
300 of these pricing indices. It's a repeat sales price indicator. So it's based on what's actually selling in the market and if you have enough of these uh, pairs of transactions. So you track when a building sells and then when it sells again in the cycle, you can create an index if you have enough of those observations. Paris actually looks relatively quite expensive. If you compare central Paris with France as a whole, significantly more expensive. And that's, you know, kind of what you'd expect. You see that in the UK, you see that in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the Nordic market. So that's not that much, of, that's not a huge surprise. You know, the core cool markets are always going to be more expensive than the wider country level index. But also you can see if I put on central London and central and the central areas of the German ACTs, Paris is relatively more expensive than these markets in comparison with where they were at the, at the height of the last move. So Paris looks relatively expensive at the moment. You know, on, it's very liquid, but it's also very expensive. You know, if you look at the prime yields, they're ducking under three percent in some of the very central markets. So that might be a that might start to hold back some of the investment flows, and we're starting to see a little bit of a softening in terms of the yields in some markets. And I'll I'll talk about that in, uh, later. But one of the, one of the things that this this pricing chart is doing is it's it's kind of forcing you know the, the, there's very strong pricing, very strong price growth that we've seen in Paris, very strong demand for for for, for property. Is it starting to push investors to be slightly more creative about how they access the market? So one of the things we've seen is a, a substantial pickup in what we're calling forward acquisitions. So that's mostly investment managers or some of the non-listed REITs acquiring buildings before they're constructed essentially. So funding a developer to build the building for them. So Paris is actually the number one market in Europe for forward acquisitions it's on the office sector. So we're seeing a lot of that activity and some of that seems to be linked to the Grand Paris plan. So that's, you know, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but it's a, it's a kind of a densification of the urban transport. I mean, Paris has always already got an excellent urban transport network, you know, it's significantly denser than, than London with the Metro and the RER. But this is a massive infrastructure project. It's going to link parts of the city that were kind of more difficult to travel to and from than previously. And if I overlay these forward, ac forward acquisitions on this, on this chart of the transport network, you should be able to see, hopefully, that there's a link between where these acquisitions are taking place and where the densification of the transport network is. So if I go back again and just show it again, you can see towards the south of the city where we're, we're starting to see more, well, where, where there's going to be a big improvement in terms of transport infrastructure. Also, to kind of the west of the city and the western business districts and to the north as well around Saint Denis where the Olympics, a lot of the Olymp activity in the 2024 Olympics is going to be. So it seems like investors are trying to position themselves in advance at uh, this, uh, this major infrastructure plan, you know, improved connectivity will certainly improve the performance of these local office markets, drive rents up, and you know, as an investor, you'll benefit from that. And interestingly, actually, as well, when you think about pricing, you'd expect there to be something of a discount if you're acquire, if you're forward acquiring an asset, because you're taking on some of the, some of the risk associated often with the letting side, but actually, We've, what we've seen in, the, in this year, in the last couple of years, is actually a narrowing of the gap between the acquisition prices, and this is based on a price per square meter basis, the acquisition prices for a new, refurb, you know, recent, very recent refurbished asset, and what investors are paying for a forward acquisition. So actually, it's more expensive, it has been more expensive to acquire, to do a forward acquisition than it has been to acquire a new asset, according to these numbers. And this is based on a you know, the sample of the deals done. So there might be a little bit of a sort of, uh, you know, it's kind of difficult to control for all the qualities involved in the assets, but I've just done this for central Paris and the western business districts. So the markets, are, the market areas are the same, the same. And that's really a sign of the fact that investors are quite bullish about rental growth. And if you're willing to pay a higher price to acquire these assets before they build, you could be fairly positive about rental growth prospects. But I think the, the one caveat to that I would say is that if you look at the amount of uh, unlet stock that's going to be delivered to the west of the city next year especially, it looks relatively high. So that's the downside risk to some of these certainly the positive rental growth forecasts that investors might be expecting. And then two final points before I hand over to the panel and hand back to Richard. Um, first one, 
and I alluded to this at the start already, and this is talking about the sort of the alternate or the alternative sectors. If you look on a total level in France, you know, what we call the, you know, what we've got here is the kind of the bed sector, so hotels, student housing, apartments, straight residential, and senior housing, and I've also added logistics in there. Relatively small part of the French market, you know, Paris offices is around 70% alone of the real estate market in France, real estate investment market in France. If you, if you look at this comparable figure for the UK or for Germany, it's much, much higher. Approaching probably 40% of the market would be these kind of alternate asset classes. Across Europe as a whole, it's around the same. So I, actually, I think that's a positive for the French market. You know, we're starting to see some moves into French residential. There's a very large portfolio that sold at the end of last year. Properties led to, I think, as SNCF employees. And there's been also some other recent announcements recently about um, acquisitions of kind of social housing. So the fact that this part, you know, especially the apartment sector, looks relatively underdeveloped from, an, from a, an institutional point of view, I think is a good thing for the market because I think there's probably an opportunity there to institutionalize it in the way that we're starting to see in the UK. Certainly already, you know, Germany's you know, incredibly well established, but also in the Netherlands or in the Nordic market, or so in Spain as well. And then my final slide, just about pricing really. As I mentioned, your know, pricing in, in Paris is very high at the moment. This is a chart that shows, it's an average yield series. It's produced, it's kind of a modeled yield series using all the acquisitions that we have in our database for each of these chart, each of these markets. And the point I really want to make here is actually we've seen a flattening out in the yields movement, yield movements in most of the core markets globally in the last probably six months. So I think that's in reaction to some of the the geopolitical risks and the expense of acquiring real estate. Now, that's despite the fact that you know, interest, you know, interest rates aren't, don't look like they're going to go up anytime soon. You know, the Federal Reserve reduced their base rate yesterday. But that's certainly something to think about. Can the market get any more expensive given the risks that we're already seeing? So that's it for me. I'm going to hand back to Richard now, who's going to introduce the panel. Great, thanks, Tom.